Hi everybody, Mrs. Britton is on. Welcome to my channel. It's such a pleasure to be back again to speak to you on the Word of God. Many people are asking serious questions. They want to know where this planet is heading and will we ever go back to what used to be. You know, the Word of God has all the answers to all the questions you are asking. So join me in this study and discover for yourselves what the Word of God, particularly the Revelation, has to say about the times we are living in. Here's a gentle reminder to consult with the Word of God, your own Bible. You may not have it with you presently, but when you find the time, Get your Bible and read the text for yourself if you are able to do so. So as we begin, let us pray. O oh God, our oh help in ages past, our oh hope for years to come. You are our shelter from the stormy blast and you are our eternal hope. We praise and glorify your name. And we invite your presence into this study and into virtual space with us to give us understanding and knowledge and motivation to do your will. This is my prayer with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. Today, friends, we are continuing with the study of the messages to the churches in Asia. Just a quick review. John was given seven distinct messages to give to seven churches in Asia. And we have already established that those messages, each of those messages has three applications. One, the historical application. Two, the prophetic application. And three, the universal application. We have looked at four of the churches so far. The last church we looked at was Thyatira. Today, we look at the next church, the next message to Sardis. So let's dig right into the message Jesus gave to Sardis. The first thing we will do, friends, is place Sardis in history. For Sardis was a real place. Yes, it was a very real place. And what we do know about Sardis in history is that it had a glorious past. But by the time the Roman Emperor, sorry, the Roman Empire um, became fully established, Sardis had begun to lose its, um, its state of prestige, so to speak. So most of its glory was about its past history. Now, Sardis was built on a very steep hill. That's the place. It was built on a very steep hill. And the walls were very tall and strong. And so the occupants of that city thought that um, Sardis was impregnable. And so they guarded the walls very carelessly. But what is noticeable about Sardis is that it really did not have anything outstanding for it at that present time. Its glory um, was really associated with its past history. So let's read Jesus' message to Sardis. And we will read from Revelation chapter 3 verses 1 to 6. That is Revelation chapter 3 verses 1 to 6 and I am reading from the hard copy the New King James versions Revelation chapter 3 verses 1 to 6 here is the message and unto the angel of the church in Sardis write these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars I know thy works that you have a name that you live but you are dead be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for i have not found your works perfect before god remember therefore how you have received and heard and hold fast 
and repent. If, therefore, you shall not watch, I will come on you as a thief, and you shall not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Now in this message, let's look at the historical application first. Notice that there are a few faithful Christians in the church in Sardis. And Jesus commends them. He said they have not defiled themselves. They have remained faithful. And so they will be rewarded with white raiment. In other words, the garb of righteousness. So there are a few faithful Christians in Sardis. However, the large majority of the Christians in Sardis are lazy. They are lethargic. They're sluggish. Notice Jesus does not identify any sin, open sin or apostasy like he did with Pergamum uh, and Thyatira. There's no open sin and, and apostasy in, in, in Sardis. It's just that they were lazy with the word of God. They, they were just letting things run by. They weren't as Jesus said, you think you are alive, but you are dead. You are dead. And this essentially is the message. The church was a sluggish, lethargic church. And Jesus said to them, if you do not awake and repent, then I will come on you as a thief in the night. Now Jesus offers a three-tire solution. To the lethargy in Sardis. What were the three things Jesus said they ought to do in order to cure this spiritual condition? One, Jesus said, be watchful and strengthen those things that are ready to die. Wake up! Wake up! He said to them, hold fast to what you already have. And the third thing he said, repent. Three essential aspects to get them to become alive again and in love with Jesus and in love with others. First, be watchful and strengthen the things that are ready to die. Hold fast to what you already know. And thirdly, repent. Repent. Confess your sin and return to Jesus. Now, what would be the fate of the church in Sardis if they refuse to take heed to Jesus' uh, recommendation? We find the answer in verse 3 of Revelation chapter 3. Jesus says to them, I will come as a thief in the night. Well, you know what a thief is? Uh, a thief never announces <laughs> the time he's going to appear. And the fact that Jesus uh, said he's going to come as a thief to them means that there would be destruction, judgment, sentences, and penalty. Jesus references uh, this thief simile from Matthew chapter 24 and, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So let's read those two texts together. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Matthew 24 verses 42 to 44. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would have not allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you must also be ready, 
for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Let's look at the next reference in 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 1 to 8. Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of the light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Praise the Lord. Friends, we do not know the exact hour, the exact date that Jesus will return to this earth. Of course, we know he's going to return. He says he will, and he will come because he keeps his promises. And friends, we need him to come. We need him to come. But we do not know the exact date. But let me tell you something. There is a group of people who that group is preparing to meet him. They, they're getting themselves ready. But for those who are not getting themselves ready, Jesus will come as a thief. They will not be prepared to meet him. No one is prepared for a thief. Jesus says, for those of you who are not prepared, I am going to come on you as a thief in the night. Whether it's next month, next year, next decade, Jesus is advising us to watch, be alert, be sober. That was the message to the church in Sardis. Be alert, be sober, be watchful. Become alive again. Otherwise, you will end up in a very sad situation. And this is a message for us. I know I'm jumping ahead to the universal application. This is a message for us today. To be alert, to be vigilant, to be sober, to awake. To not be lulled into this false security as the church in Sardis. Otherwise, Jesus will come unto us as a thief. Now let's look at the prophetic application. The, the period of Sardis is applied prophetically to the post-Reformation church from 1565 to the year 1740. What was happening in the church at that time? Let me tell you what was happening. The Protestants in that post-Reformation period, they had degenerated into a state of, uh, how should I say, um, cold formalism and spiritual complacency. They were dead. They weren't alive. In that period also, there was this um, growth and rising up of secularism and rationalism if you remember the period what was happening in france at that time when you study history they had enthroned reason as their god so the church was seriously affected by it and, and what issued back then in the church was a set of creedal forms you know and you have it, people just repeating creeds they, 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 they love 
for the word of God. The, remember, their love for the word of God was revived during the Reformation. But now that love for the word of God had seriously declined. It was waning. And they were more focused on the rationalism and formalism and, and secularism around them. You know, so they were dead. They were not alive. That was for the period 1565 to 1740. And friends, I want to tell you, that was real. Check your history out. It's right there for you and I to know. Third, what was the universal application? Just as how um, prophetically for that period, the church was full of creedal, dry, philosophical arguments. What is happening today? Think about what is happening today. In many of the churches that name the name of Christ, look at what is happening. A lot, there's so much talk about past experiences in Christ. but And these are important. But when you look at what is happening today, there is no evidence that the faith in Jesus is growing. It's a lot about creedal statements and philosophy. But when it comes to uh, holding up Christ above the earth, when it comes to the study of the word of God, think about it. While I'm speaking, I'm, I'm hearing some preachers and what they are preaching about. Where's the word of God? It has waned. Their love for, for, for the word of God has declined. And Jesus is saying, listen, if you don't wake up and become vigilant, I'm going to come on you as a thief in the night. You are just making a mockery of yourself. Friends, if you belong to a church where it's just a repetition of, of creeds, C-R-E-E-D-S, and where there is a lot of um, teaching of the philosophies of men. You have to make a decision. Because as I said before in past videos, God's word is what guides us in the way of salvation. Only God's word. And God's word must be given precedence over every other word so to speak i'm not saying other words aren't important but when it comes to our salvation and what the lord requires of us as those who name the name of christ then it's the word of god we go to we do not rely on creeds or philosophical arguments we listen to what the word of god says and we order our lives through the power of the holy spirit as the word requires of us. So we really need to do some introspection. As Paul says, you and I need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. To see if we are in the path of salvation. If we are really obedient to the precepts of the word of God. You know what I'm talking about. Yes friends, in verse 2 of Revelation chapter 3, Jesus says, to the church in Sardis. I have not found your works perfect toward, toward God. And Jesus is say, he said that to um, the church in the period 1565 to 1740, prophetically. And he's saying that to us today. I have not found your works perfect toward, toward God. In other words, Christians who name the name of Christ, many of them are not following true religion. Their commitment to God is, is not profound and, and living. How can you and I make or, or do perfect works toward God? How can we do it? Let's see what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 verses 44 to 48. It says, But I say to you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. So you may be the sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. 
For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Amen. So friends, our perfect works are to love God. But what is stressed here in Matthew chapter 5 is to love our neighbors. Sometimes there's so much talk. There's so much talk. But when you look for the fruit, how we impact the lives of others in a spiritual way, in a healthy way, to guide them in the path of salvation, we can't find it because there's no commitment. And so, friends, we, we have to really uh, do some serious introspection to see if we are like Sardis. And if we are, we need to be alert. We need to awake out of that stupor. Now, friends, I must make it clear to you that we are not saved by works. Every Christian knows that. We are saved by what? The grace of God, his favor, his mercy. Jesus himself <laughs> saves us. However, when we are saved, we do the works that Jesus requires us to do. The same works that Jesus did. We are not exempt from doing good works. You can't say as a Christian, I'm saved. <laughs> I'm on my way to heaven. And you disregard the poor and the enfeebled and the less fortunate and the suffering and sickness around. No. We are to love each other practically, in practical ways. As First John 4 verse 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. We love others because Jesus loves us. And Jesus places a love in our hearts for others. We can't love others of our own selves. So many people are hurt. So many people are hurting. We can't love others of our own selves. It's Jesus who places his love in our hearts. And we are able to love and do good works to and for other people. So how does Jesus end the message to Sardis, to the church in Sardis? He said, if you do what I recommend that you do, then I will clothe you in right, white raiment. In other words, I will give you the garb, the, the dress of righteousness. I will call you righteous. He says, then I will confess you before my father. I will say, father, this is my daughter. Mary, this is my son, uh, John. And he says, I'm going to tell the angels in heaven about you. Isn't that wonderful? It's so wonderful. And he says to them, I will give you eternal life. Those are his rewards. I mean, what more can we want as a church, as the church of God? White Raymond, he's going to talk to his father for us. He's going to boast about us before his heavenly angels. Wonderful. Just wonderful. So friends, if you are a lazy Christian, if you are a Christian whose eyes are sleepy from the stupor of everything that is happening around us, then the call is for you to wake up. Open your eyes. Pay attention to the word of God. And do his perfect works. This is very important. No one of us will walk the heavenly streets if we have not touched someone else's life. God has no hands but our hands. He has no eyes but our eyes. No feet but our feet. In other words, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to work us. To work in us and to work us so that other lives will be positively impacted by the gospel of salvation. So if you are a lazy Christian, the word is for you today. Wake up. Be vigilant. I am going to reward you. So a 
abundantly if you only wake up. As we come to a close today, friends, I want to say thank you so much for viewing this uh, video, for coming in and listening to what uh, the Word of God on this channel. I appreciate your presence. If you have any comments or questions, write them down below. I want to encourage you to share, tell someone that Mrs. Britton is on and we are studying the Word of God. And also subscribe to this channel. Subscribe, subscribe, hit the notification bell, give it a thumbs up. And I know for now you're not disappointed with what you are learning. I keep praying that God will bless you with understanding. Let us pray. Oh God, you love us with an everlasting love. You want us to be saved. You want us to live eternally for this is what you created us for. So as you speak to us through these messages, I pray that the Holy Spirit will continue his work in our lives and that each of us will rededicate our lives to you and for others they would surrender their lives to you. And please keep us faithful until you come. In the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Until next time when Mrs. Britain is on.